Mark's gospel is a simple one. Not simplistic, but simple. It is not concerned with Jesus' fulfillment of prophecy, as is the gospel of Matthew. Nor is it like the historical account of Jesus' life in Luke's gospel. And yet, neither is it like the Jesus-centric philosophical focus of the gospel of John. Mark's gospel is concerned with bringing Jesus into focus. It shows Jesus as a real man. It shows who he was, what he did, and how he behaved. It shows him clearly, with no frills or pageantry. He brings Jesus off of the page and into color. Mark uses the word immediately, approximately 40 times in his gospel. No extra information, just the facts. Just the information about Jesus that you need to hear. And then he immediately moves on to the next thing. Immediately. The Gospel of Mark. Jesus in living color. Good morning. Great to be with you. Uh, if you're new with us, uh, welcome to Foundation Church. My name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. Uh, we have been working through the Gospel of Mark for about the last five or six weeks now, and we're still in the first chapter. And so if that freaks you out, we take it slow here, apparently. Um, we're really spending a bunch of time in the first chapter of Mark because we really want to lay a good foundation for kind of how Mark writes, how he presents Jesus, uh, who Jesus is, because we believe these kind of first couple of chapters are absolutely essential to understanding uh, who our Savior is, why He came, and it'll make sense for the rest of the book having put in the work on the front end. So if you've got a Bible, open it up to Mark 1, we're going to be in verse 35, we're only taking four verses today, and as we get there, uh, would you guys pray with me and ask the Holy Spirit to work deep in our hearts today. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace uh, to your people, thank you for your love towards us, thank you for your common grace upon all men. Father, we just pray that today you would reveal yourself uh, to those who do not yet know you, you would reveal yourself to us, you would show uh, off the glory of your Son, Jesus, that your Holy Spirit would work deep in our hearts, would work in our minds, that your Holy Spirit would soften our hearts where they are hard, that they would work deep in, in what is going on in our lives. And Father, we just pray that you would shine yourself glorious today, you would show off your glory by acting and working here at Foundation Church this very morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, for those of you who've been coming here for a while, you will have noticed that I, I didn't use a lot of Australian football analogies for the last few months, right? Today ends that. Back to the Australian football analogies that, that don't work, right? Because none of you know what Australian football is. But I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep, I take it like my role here is to preach the gospel and educate you about Australian football. And so that's what I'm going to do. And today really is just more of just a, just a lesson that I learned through my years playing. And so if you don't know, um, I played kind of a, the equivalent of like maybe like a college level. We don't have the same kind of levels in Australia, but I was, I was kind of really serious. I was about 19 or 20 years old, really, really serious about my football. I was trying to play it. I would have loved to have gone professional. Obviously, that didn't happen. Uh, and, and I just was, was like so committed to the game. And we would always play our games on Saturdays at 2 p.m. Saturdays at 2 p.m. Every single Saturday we were playing a game. And that was just the time that our kind of, our grade, our level um, played. And so we would kind of all get the results of the games at the same time. And no matter what, we were playing Saturday afternoon. But we had this saying around the club. And the saying was, hey guys, the game starts on Friday. Like, but, but you just told me it started on, on Saturday. We had this saying, because what we wanted to do as a club was make sure, and as a team, we wanted to make sure that we were all well prepared. And so we said, hey guys, the game starts on Friday. And so what that simply meant was, hey, you know what, you don't get to go out and party Friday nights. You know, you need to be taking care of yourself Friday nights. Even Friday afternoon, you need to be, need to be thinking, hey, what am I going to eat for dinner? How am I going to load up for energy, carbs and veggies and, and, and good protein and, and making sure that you are ready to go? Because we all understood that, hey, you know, we could all show up on Saturday at 2 p.m. and play a game, but if we didn't start preparing the night before, we didn't start preparing early, we were going to be in big trouble because often the difference between a good game and a bad game was our preparation. Big difference. Big, big difference. And so we would make 
a big deal of that. And then also, uh, after we'd finished the game, we also kind of, like, as we finished up, said, hey, guys, make sure that we learn to recover. Make sure we recover well. And so often on a Sunday morning, what we'd do is we'd all go to the beach. We'd kind of walk, walk through the water, you know, the really ice-cold water, doing the ice bath thing. Uh, we, we, we would meet at the club and make sure we just all stretch out, go for a jog, just make sure that we can kind of recover well. Because we knew that, hey, even though the game was kind of central on a Saturday, we needed to prepare on a Friday and we needed to recover well on a Sunday to do a good job. And today, what we're simply seeing is that Jesus, who's had a massive day, has another huge kind of day coming up. He prepared and he recovered well. Now see, the recovery that I did and the preparation that I did for for my physical kind of sport that I was playing was a physical one. But Jesus, because he understands that he has a deeply spiritual battle to undertake, his preparation and his recovery are always deeply spiritual. And so if you've got your Bible open, let's go to Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Mark here, speaking of Jesus, he says, And Jesus, rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. So Jesus gets up really early in the morning, while it's still dark, goes and finds a really isolated, desolate place, and he prays. So we know the kind of day Jesus has just had. So Jesus kicked off his day, the day before this happened, by going to the synagogue, preaching a message, casting a demon out of a guy. He went home, thought he was going to hang out. He had to heal Simon Peter's mother-in-law. And then just as the sun was going down, the whole town brought their sick and their needy to him so that he could heal them. He had kind of a big day. Let's call that a big day. And so, you know what I would like to do after a day that size? Sleep in and eat bacon and eggs. That's what I would like to do. But Jesus, understanding that, hey, listen, his work is not done. He understands that he's got another big day coming. It's like, well, even though I'm sure he would have loved to have slept in, even though I'm sure he would have loved to have just probably eaten bacon because he was a Jew, uh, probably, (laughs) probably eating something for breakfast back that they ate back then. Uh, He would have loved to have done that. He wakes up early. He says, rising very early in the morning while it was still dark. Went to a desolate place and prayed. See, often this uh, this passage here is kind of used to like shame you into like, you should pray better. When was the last time you got up and it was still dark and prayed and went to a desolate place? And so usually it's often used to kind of like shame people into like, well, you know what? You're not as good as Jesus. You don't pray as well as Jesus. Like, I don't do anything as well as Jesus. Why is this, why is this even an argument? Like, yes, agreed. I don't pray as well as Jesus. I don't do anything as well as Jesus. He's my example that I want to grow in and learn from. And so please, if you read this, don't feel shame. Because shame will never motivate you for an extended period of time, right? Shame will get you to do it for a little while, but you need to be motivated by grace. You need to understand that Jesus here is setting us an example on how we are to pray, how we as God's people are to set our lives up so that we can prepare for what is ahead of us and that we can recover from what we've just gone through, through prayer. Jesus is setting us an example as his people. Now, I want to give you a bit of a confession prayer is really hard. I don't just like throwing that out there. It's really hard. It's really hard to be disciplined in prayer. I really struggle with it. I really struggle with finding time to pray. I really struggle with setting uh, boundaries to make sure that I can kind of be not disrupted, that I can uh, really just get my mind focused. I really struggle with it. I'm sure many of you do too. I'm sure most of you Actually, if I was going to take kind of a poll, I'm going to go with 99.5% of you struggle with prayer, struggle to set your priorities straight, struggle to develop a prayer life that is thriving and flourishing. Many of us really struggle with it. And so rather than being pushed and motivated by maybe the shame of, well, look what Jesus did, you should be better and look, be like him, let's be motivated by the grace that he has freed us and prayer is good for us and he set us an example to strive after and to grow in. And so as I was preparing the message, I was praying and asking God, okay, how, how do we develop a prayer life? How would we go about developing a prayer life that is filled with good things, filled with beautiful things, filled with a thriving and flourishing and vibrant relationship with the Lord that prepares us for what we have to do and allows us to recover from what we've just been through? 
And so I came up with eight points. How do we do it? How do we develop our prayer life? Number one, we need to see our prayer life as a priority. Is we need to see it as a priority. Now, there are many, many different things that are striving and fighting to be the number one priority in our life. You know what? We got kids. We got family commitments. We got relational commitments. We got work commitments. We got all sorts of stuff that's striving and saying, hey, I need your first attention. I need your first energies. I need your first fruits. And friends, the reality is that we need to keep our priorities in order. And our number one priority is our relationship with the Lord, our relationship with God on high. And so if we're keeping our priorities in order and we're putting our priority with God in order, we need to make sure that communication with God, our Father, communication with the God who loves us, communication with the God who's in control of all things sits right at the top of the list. Our communication with God needs to be a priority. And so we need to simply look at our priorities in our lives, step back for a moment and say, okay, what what am I prioritizing? What am I putting all of my energy into? What am I putting my first time into? What am I putting my first thoughts into? And friends, we need to put prayer in that place. We need to put communicating with our Father in that place. The number two on how we develop a prayer life is that we need to see our lives as a battle. I once read a book uh, by A.W. Tozer, and kind of like the whole title gives away the premise of the book. It's called, This World, Question Mark, Playground or Battleground? And Tozer just simply wrestles with the idea, hey, many of us come into our lives and think it's just a playground, right? We think that we're living lives that are just so comfortable and simple and relaxed that we can just treat our relationships, treat what's going on around us, treat what's going on in the world as kind of just like a playground. Hey, we're just here to hang out and play for a little while, and then we're going to go away. And Tozer makes the great point, I believe the Bible teaches very clearly that this world is not just a playground, It has gifts to be enjoyed, absolutely, but it also is very much a battleground. Is that Satan very, very, very much, even though he was defeated at the cross, wants to make each and every individual Christian so ineffective in their ministry that no people are reached by you. Satan wants to take those who are already enslaved to their sin and push them deeper and deeper and deeper into the dungeon of sin so that they believe that God could never break them out. Satan wants to destroy the people of God, and he wants to destroy the image of God. And each and every human on this planet bears the image of God. And so if we see this world as a battleground, that is going to change the way that we pray. See, Jesus understood, hey, I'm in a battle here. And if we're going to prepare for a battle, I need to take some time out. I need to get away to a desolate place. I need to take some time and pray and prepare myself for what is coming. Just like I, when I was playing football, prepared myself, we as Christians need to understand that, hey, every day that we are here, God has given us something to do. God has given us a mission. He's given us a message to take to those who need to hear the good news of Jesus, that need to feel the good news of Jesus, that need to see the gospel in action. And he's given us that message, and he wants us to take that out, and he wants us to tell and show people that Jesus is king, that God saves sinners like them, and God loves sinners like them. He's given us that message, and we have a very real enemy who wants to oppose us. And so if we can see our lives as a battle, we will be intentional about developing our prayer life. Is that we, thirdly, need to see prayer as recovery. We need to see prayer as recovery. How many of you, after a really tough day, really hard day, a bunch of stuff went wrong, maybe there was conflict in family or relationships or whatever went wrong, come home and you say, you know what I just need to do? I just need to relax on the couch. I just want to eat my favorite food. I just want to hang out with my family. That, that's where I'll get my recovery from. You see, there's nothing wrong with watching TV. There's nothing wrong with, with, with eating good food. There's nothing wrong with hanging out with your family. But what happens to us is that when we go through something really hard, when we're exhausted and we don't go to prayer, we're actually substituting something, a gift that God has given to us and treating it like God himself. We're saying, well, if I could just watch TV, then I'd be okay. If I could just eat my favorite food, I'd be okay. And what we're doing is we're substituting a created thing for the creator God. 
Friends, we need to make a priority that if we have struggled, if we've been in a battle, if we have just been going through a hard, hard time, would we see prayer as our recovery? Would we run to God first? Would we run to God and ask Him to fill us with His Spirit? Would we run to God and ask Him to be our comfort? Would we near to, ask God to be near to us in times of trouble? Would God be where we go for our recovery? And then in light of going to God first, then we can truly enjoy the gifts that He's given us as He has given them to us. Fourthly, we need to see prayer as preparation. We need to see prayer as preparation. Is that God has given each and every one of us a mission. He's given us something to do. He's given us the role of being lights to the nation. He's given us the role of, of being the ones who go and make disciples in all the nations. He's given you a job. He's given you a family. He's given you a place in which you can have influence into people's lives. And if we're going into this battle and we're going into these relationships and we're wanting to represent Christ, but we're not preparing ourselves in prayer first, we're going to be in trouble. So we need to take the time and ask God to fill us with His Spirit. Ask God to lead us. Ask God to show us what we are to do. And so very often in those moments of preparation, God gives us the still, silent voice of the Holy Spirit. He leads us. He tells us, hey, I'm going to open doors for you right now. He meets us there. He meets us in the quiet places. He meets us in the desolate places. He meets us in the times where we need to hear from Him, where we get down on our knees and we ask Him to lead us and to love us. See, prayer is a preparation for what we have before us. If you got a hard meeting, if you got something coming up on your calendar that you're not looking forward to, would you take the time in prayer? Would you prepare yourself for it and then see what the Lord does in that time? So fifth, we need to see prayer as a discipline. Prayer is a discipline. See, no one likes doing cardio. Unless you like doing cardio and then you're weird, right? No one likes doing cardio. No one's like, you know what? I'm just going to go run for an extended period of time. That's going to be awesome. That's not fun at all. It's not fun for anyone, right? If you've, if you've deluded yourself into thinking that that is a good idea, then well, power to you, right? But you know what? Doing cardio is a discipline. It's a discipline. It takes discipline to get up and do something that's not fun, that you don't like, that actually makes you feel really bad for a period of time, but you know that it's good for you. You know that it's actually going to bring you life. It's actually going to bring you health. It's going to make you feel better. You know, a lot of times we can be so daunted by prayer, so daunted by the prospect of us having to kind of just hang out with God that we, we kind of shirk away from the discipline. We're afraid of actually doing it. But the beauty is that if we can practice the discipline, if we can develop the discipline of prayer, if we can kind of really block out the time that we need to be spending in prayer, God brings good things through it. God brings good things through it. And this leads me into my next point is in developing our prayer life, we need to see prayer as a joy. We need to see prayer as a joy. Let me tell you a story. I've never had a time of prayer and then got up and was like, well, that was a waste of time. Never. You know what? Every time I've been able to get down with the Lord and be in His presence and, and speak to Him and engage with Him and kind of be uh, just, just waiting upon Him, you leave and I'm so filled with joy. I was just able to commune with my Father. I was just able to be in the presence of the Most High God. I was just able to be in the presence of the Almighty, the one who spoke the heavens and the earth into being. Christian, you have the ability to be in the presence of God Most High. Is it, friends, we pray as believers by the power of the Holy Spirit to God our Father, and our prayers are brought to God our Father through our intercessor, Jesus Christ. Friends, we have a, a ticket into the throne room of the entire universe anytime we want, anytime we want. And you know, when we go there, it's not just the king that we see, it's our Father who loves us, who cares for us, who gave us all things, who wants to bless us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, who has given us all things, whose love will never leave us, there's nothing on this earth that can come against us, that can remove us from the love that God has for us in Christ Jesus. 
And we have the ability to go into His presence any moment of any day. Prayer is a joy. If we see prayer as a joy, how much easier will it be for us to engage in prayer? How much easier will it be for us to make the time for prayer? As prayer is our joy, we will grow in our discipline. So number seven, we need to see prayer as a recharge. We need to see prayer as a recharge. Prayer is a place that God recharges us. I don't want to make some silly electric car joke. It's not not like this hyper-spiritual thing where it's like only in prayer can we get plugged in to God and grow in Him. No, no, no. In prayer, we're able to recharge, right? Imagine you have uh, an all-inclusive pass to kind of the best gym in the world, the best health spa in the world, the best kind of, you know, masseuses and all of that stuff. It's all-inclusive. You can go there any time you want, and you don't. That's prayer, right? Like prayer is a place that we can go and recharge. Prayer is a place that we can go and get healthy. Prayer is a place that we can go and be taken care of. That God can can nurture and care for our souls. That our Father can can meet us in our deepest brokenness and hurt and pain and bring, bring healing and peace to it. It's like we've got this ticket to go to a place where we can be cared for and loved at any moment of any day. We're like, well, you know what? It's kind of just down the road a little bit. I don't really want to go there. You know what? Prayer is such a joy, and prayer is a place where we meet God to be recharged by Him. If we see it as that, our prayer lives will follow. And then finally, prayer is our commissioning time. We need to see prayer as our commissioning time. So to be commissioned is to give a, give a mission, to have a, be given a mission. And prayer is the time in which God so often will lead us in His will, will direct us in His will. Prayer is so often the time that God will, hey, give us that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit saying, hey, I want you to do this. I need you to go in this direction. I'm going to open a door for you here. See, if we don't give the priority to prayer, then we will miss out so often on the open doors that God has for us. If we're so busy and there's so much going on in our minds, then we will so often miss the opportunities that God has for us. And prayer is a time in which we can be commissioned for the mission that He has for us. So how, does this, how do we do this, right? How do we find time? What opportunities do we have to pray? What things do we need to put into our lives so that our prayer would become a priority for us? Is it individually we need to keep our priorities right. Individually, we need to find time where we can sit with God in a quiet space and we can pray to Him. So for me, uh, often it looks like actually blocking out time on my schedule in the morning. See, I like to be kind of schedule orientated. I like to have um, knowing where I need to be at whatever time. And so if I can block out time on my schedule for prayer, that'll actually help me keep the discipline of doing it. Now, some of you are like, yeah, schedule, that's, that's what I need to do. And so do it, block it out. Find a place where you can go, that you can have time, that you can have peace, you can get away, you turn your phone off, close the laptop, turn the TV off, turn the radio off, remove all the distractions that are so around us and spend time with your father. Husbands and wives, serve your husband or serve your wife by allowing them to do that. Take care of the kids. You know, we're talking you know, half an hour, an hour. Take care of the kids. Do what you can do to serve one another so that each and every one of us can get our priorities right, that we can pray to our God, that we can know Him, that we can be close to Him. Secondly, we can pray as a family. So my wife and I have recently just started uh, kind, of a, kind of a very easy, simple prayer time as a family. What we do is we simply sit down, and I ask her, I said, hey, what would you like me to pray for you about? She gives me a list. I, she asks me, hey, hey, how can I pray for you this week? I give her a list. We talk about my little boy. We say, hey, what does Jack need prayer for this week? How can we pray for him? She writes it down. She sticks it on the fridge. We pray together there. Every time we go past the fridge, we can just look at the list and be like, yep, going to be praying for my wife for that. 
And then we have a list of church planners, we have a list of missionaries, we have a list of people who need prayer. And so we actually just open the book that we have and we just read about them, read about the family, read about the mission that they're on, read about what God's doing in their lives and we can pray for others as well. So we find this time once a week to set our family's prayer priorities straight and then we fight to keep it. So we fight to keep that. This is just an idea. Families, you need to do what works for you, but praying as a family will bring you close. Praying as a family will bring you good. So we need to pray in community groups. Our community groups exist to obviously study the Word, to fellowship with one another, and to care for one another. One of the best ways that we can care for one another is that we can pray for one another. Because every now and again, the community group that I'm in, you know, we won't even study the sermon. We'll just simply go around our group and say, how can we pray for you? What do you need prayer for? And we're able to share what God is doing in our lives, able to share the struggles that God is bringing before us that we're trying to work through, and we're able to pray for one another. So want your group to love one another. If you want that, pray for one another. And then finally, as a church, we open up this building on Monday mornings at 11 a.m. every single Monday, and we just pray. So if you're available, if you're just kind of, you know, I know it's tough if you're working kind of nine to five, but if you, you've got the ability, hey, this, the doors are open on Monday mornings at 11, come into the sanctuary, it's quiet, it's peaceful, there's people here, and we pray for the church, and we pray for the kingdom, we pray for what God is doing in people's lives. So come on, come down here. Monday mornings at 11, the church is open, and we have every single week people who show up and pray. So it's open to all. Whoever would like to come, we would love to have you pray with us. So many of you have kind of heard uh, the, the throwaway Christian tagline, pray without ceasing. Kind of like, you know, it's often used to kind of little spiritual kind of sprinkling on top of a conversation. Hey, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Make sure you're praying without ceasing. Many of us just leave those, those kind of like little things like, what does that mean? What does it mean to pray without ceasing? Like if I did that, I wouldn't get any work done. If I did that, my kids would starve. If I did that, I wouldn't be able to do anything. So often it's used to kind of like, all right, we'll just pray without ceasing. That just means I just need to stop everything that I'm doing and just, just, just do that. But if you read kind of the, the whole idea of praying without ceasing in the context in which the Bible puts it, it makes so much more sense. Is it, it comes from Paul writing to the Thessalonian church. And as he closes out his letter to them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he gives them some, some advice. He gives them some, some exhortations as he closes. And so starting in verse 12, he says, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all, See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Pray without ceasing. Finds itself in between two verses. The first verse is rejoice always. And the closing verse is, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. What I think Paul is telling them to do is not, hey, stop everything, get down on your knees and never stop praying. What he's saying is, as you live your lives, as you simply just go about your business, as you do what God has called you to do, rejoice. Rejoice always. You know what? When you rejoice you pray. And as you pray, you rejoice. As you go about your lives, give thanks in all circumstances. Is it the prayer that we are to give, how we are to pray without ceasing as God's people, is to be joyous and happy people, to give thanks to God in all circumstances, even the hard ones, even the bad ones. It's just to keep God so very clearly on our mind that no matter what happens, we're able to rejoice, we're able to be happy, we're able to give thanks. You see, prayer is not always just a standalone event that needs to stand on your calendar and be completed. 
Prayer is simply a part of what it means to live the Christian life. Is it to be a Christian is to be one who prays. And as you find yourself wanting to pray, as you find yourself trying to set, a, set aside you know, time to do this, you need to find a place where you won't be disturbed. That's what Jesus did or thought he did. Is it Mark 1, 36 and 37 tells us, and Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. So poor Jesus, right, he's just had a huge day. He tries to go find a desolate place, get away, spend some time in prayer. And then when everyone else at the house wakes up, they're like, hey, we're going to pull together a search party to go and find Jesus because we don't know where he is. And so they, they, they rock up and like, hey, Jesus, what's up? He's like, I was just praying, man. You just interrupted my prayer with dad. Like, okay, okay. They tell him everyone is looking for you. You know what? As we pray, there should be times when people need to go looking for you. Put your phone away, put the TV off. Find a place that's quiet. Find a place that you can get away from all things. You see, the uh, disciples finding Jesus isn't a bad thing. See, Jesus doesn't rebuke them for finding him, but he also doesn't apologize for leaving, right? When people come to find us, if we're praying, don't rebuke them for, for coming to find us. They obviously need us. They need you. They want to, want to know something from you. But never apologize for praying. Never apologize for going to do that. Never apologize for spending time with your Father. And see, to step out for prayer is not a bad thing. And so after the disciples have found Jesus, Jesus tells them, hey, we have a job to do. I'm prepared. I'm ready, I've done my prayer, and now I need to go and do my job. Mark 1, 35 through 39. And he, Jesus, said to them, let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for this is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for this is why I came out. You know what Jesus' primary ministry was on this earth? It was a preaching ministry. Is that many people have tried to make the case that Jesus' primary ministry was kind of a wonder working ministry, it was one where he simply just did miracles. So that's never the case. It's not what we see Jesus himself saying. See, I've even heard pastors say, hey, you know what? Good works are the gospel. Doing good works is the gospel. It's not true. It's not true. That's not the gospel. See, good works, us loving and serving people, us caring for people, they are the fruit of the heart that believes the gospel. Good works are the fruit of the heart that believes the gospel. See, we need to be told the gospel. What do we call the telling of the gospel? Preaching. Preaching is the telling of the gospel. And see, this is the primary responsibility of Jesus' ministry. Very clearly, he says, hey, I'm going to go and preach because this is why I've come. I've come here to preach the gospel. And if we go back simply to, to a couple of verses earlier in Mark 1, we see the gospel that Jesus is preaching. Mark 1, 14 through 15 tells us, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus comes in, he preaches the kingdom of God and he preaches repentance and belief. Repentance and and belief. Turn from your sin and your brokenness and believe in me. Amen. That is the gospel that Jesus preaches. He spread his message from town to town. Is that as he went from town to town preaching that message, what followed was the actions of the gospel. What followed was the fact that demons were cast out, that darkness was being pushed back, people were healed, and people were made whole again, all in response to God, the, the preaching ministry of Jesus Christ. What God did through the preaching ministry was good deeds. We can never get those two mixed up. 
You see, we need to understand that the work of Jesus in preaching never lost its importance. Never lost its importance. Jesus came to preach the gospel, and for the last 2,000 years, the church has grown and Christians have come in to the church by the preaching of the gospel. Is that the preaching ministry of the gospel is what God sees as the most important. So what is the preaching ministry of the gospel then? What is the preached word? What uh, do I mean when I say, hey, you need to preach the gospel? You're like, we should probably define that. If I'm telling you that it's the most important thing, you should define it, and I will. So in the Greek, the word for preach is keruso. Keruso is the word for preach, and it appears 61 times in the New Testament. And so it shows up fairly regularly, the word keruso, and it's translated into English in three different ways. Three different ways. See, often when we translate a Greek word, we can't simply uh, translate it perfectly into one English word. We need to, to look at the context in which it's used, and then in the context in which that word is used, we translate it into multiple different English words. And so the three English words that this word keruso is translated into, the first one is preach. And the context that it's predominantly used in is kind of like what I'm doing right now. I'm standing on a stage and I'm addressing a people and I'm proclaiming the good news of the gospel. I am preaching to you. Right now, I am kerusoing the Word of God. Is it the second way that it's trans translated and the second word that is often used within the English is proclaim. Usually, when it's used in this way, it has kind of more of a general sense. It's not necessarily kind of in a, in a church service. It's often simply to a group of people. Proclaim the good news. Proclaim Jesus. It's to proclaim Jesus often has a more general sense. It's more kind of like, hey, you know what? You've got a smaller group of people, some believers, some unbelievers. Now go and proclaim Jesus to them. Now, not many of you will get to preach the Word on a Sunday. Not many of you God has called to preach the Word on a Sunday. Not many of you God has called to stand on a stage and, and preach to a church. That's okay. So God has called some of you. That's amazing. Some of you, God has called to proclaim. You know, you will have opportunities where there are small groups of people that you are able to proclaim the Word to. You're able to proclaim Jesus to. Still, many of you are sitting, sitting in the chairs being like, well, you know what, I'm not going to preach. Uh, I'm not going to probably proclaim. I don't really want to be a leader of a small group. How does this apply to me? Is it the third use, the third English word that the word keruso is translated into is tell. Tell. Is it just actually a few verses? This is, the, this is where it gets translated, Tell is that the context that it's used in is that Jesus has proclaimed the gospel to somebody, He's healed somebody, and that person goes around telling all of His friends and everyone that He runs into about Jesus. Now, each and every one of us can tell people about Jesus. Each and every one of us can tell people of what God has done in our lives. Each and every one of us can just talk to friends and tell them about Jesus, can we not? is that each and every one of us can tell. So each and every one of us in telling a people about Jesus is in essence kerusoing the Word of God. Is that we can tell our friends. But we must keep our message straight. We must understand the message that we are telling. We must understand the essentials of what is the gospel message. What, when we tell people about Jesus, um, makes it kerusoing the word. What, what, when we tell people about Jesus, makes it the gospel message. What are the essential elements of the gospel? So Paul gives us the essential elements. 1 Corinthians 1, 23, Paul very simply says that we preach Christ crucified. Is that the message of the gospel is simple. God saves sinners through a crucified Christ. God saves sinners through a crucified Christ. That is the message of the gospel. 
is that God saves broken sinners like you, like me, like every person that walks outside of this building, every person that you see at work, every person you see driving down I-5, God saves sinners through a crucified Christ. That is the message of the gospel. If we were to remove any one of those elements, it would no longer be the message of the gospel. We would remove its power from it. Friends, as we either preach, proclaim, or tell the message of the gospel, we must not lose any of those elements. God saves sinners through a crucified Christ, through a Jesus who hung on a Roman cross, who hung in that place, paying the price for your sin, paying the price for my sin, suffering in our place for our sin, taking the punishment that we deserve so that we might in return receive his righteousness and eternal life. Is it that Jesus suffered and died in our place for our sin so that God might save us? Is it our Savior rose again in victory from death, crushing Satan's sin and death under his heel? So friends, we must not lose any one of those essential elements, for if we lose one of them, we lose the whole message. Charles Spurgeon, who was a a Baptist preacher around around the mid-1800s in London, once told a story in one of his sermons, and he was preaching on this text. He was preaching on the text in 1 Corinthians, we preach Christ crucified, and he told the story of a church. It's a beautiful church. Uh, as, you, as you came into the courtyard before you would enter into the church building, they had this, this spectacular stone archway. And upon the stone archway were engraved into the brick, we preach Christ crucified. And as people would enter under that archway, as they would come into church, they would come into a church that would have the message of the gospel clearly proclaimed every single week. The church was vibrant. It was flourishing. People loved one another in it. Sinners were welcome to meet Jesus in this place. And as the church boldly proclaimed Christ crucified, the church blew up. It didn't blow up necessarily in numbers, but it was a healthy and vibrant church. And as the years rolled on, along that stone archway, some moss began to grow up the archway. And as as it grew, it, it began to cover the word crucified. And as the church leaders got together, they said, well, you know what? We believe that the message of the crucifixion, we believe that the message of the cross is far too offensive. Is that we, we, we can, can't have people coming in and feeling bad about their sin. We can't have people coming into our church and being confronted with such a bloody and gory message. Is that we should simply remove the cross. We should remove the crucifixion. We should just simply tell people the stories about what a great teacher Jesus was. We should tell people the great stories of what a great wise man he was. And so as they removed the message of the cross, the church began to get unhealthy. The church began to forget that they they were sinners in need of God's salvation, and they were sinners in need of God's grace, and they began to simply try and moralize and, and explain away their behavior and began to kind of only just take good life lessons from the life of Jesus and rather than the message of repentance and belief. And the church began to get sicker and sicker, and as the moss began to grow more and more along that stone archway, the word Christ began to get covered up. And as the the leaders of the church got together, they said, hey, you know what? This Jesus guy is really offensive and he says some outlandish things. And man, I don't know if we can can, can preach about Christ anymore. Maybe we should begin to bring in some some kind of mystics and maybe we should begin to kind of teach on on the teachings of Confucius or the Buddha or begin on teaching on some of the the other mystics that are around in this world. And so they said, okay, what a great idea. What a great opportunity for us to read, you know, build the church back up again by simply just preaching from, from all sorts of different sacred texts and, and beginning to teach on, on all sorts of different wise and holy men. And the church, as they began to just simply preach about anyone, preach on any topic, the church just got sicker and sicker and sicker and people just began to keep leaving and dying. Then as the moss began to simply grow over 
the word preach. They sat down and said, well, listen, we don't even have a church that wants to hear a message anymore. Maybe we should just show up every Sunday and just have tea and biscuits. Maybe we should just hang out. And so this became the we. They just showed up, fellowship together and went home. No life change, no joy, no life. And then, quite simply, the moss grew over the we. And the church died out and had to close its doors. And as they removed element after element of the gospel, the church got sicker and sicker and sicker to the point where God simply closed its doors because it no longer preached a message of hope. It no longer preached a message of life. It no longer proclaimed Christ crucified, dead, buried, and risen again for the sins of mankind, and it declined into nothing. Friends, we need to hear that warning. Is that when we tell, proclaim, or preach Jesus, we cannot take away any one of those essential elements of the gospel. God saves sinners through a crucified Christ. We may be ridiculed, we may be mocked, but to lose any one of those elements, we lose the whole message. Friends, as Jesus went around the region of Galilee proclaiming the kingdom of God, he says, the kingdom of God is at hand, it's coming through me. And as we proclaim the kingdom of God, we point back and say, the kingdom of God is here It's in the here and now, and it's come through this man who died on a cross, who was buried, who rose again, and now offers new life and freedom to all who would have it. Anyone who would come to him would be healed. Anyone who comes to him is taken care of. Friends, we must preach the whole gospel. Christ crucified for the sins of broken men and women, Christ risen for our forgiveness. We must preach this message in word and then we must live this message in deed. Is that we must prepare ourselves. We must take prayer seriously and we must practice in the proclamation of the gospel. Would we prepare in prayer and would we practice in proclamation? Would you pray with me? Father, we just pray that your spirit would be upon your church, that it would fill the hearts and the minds of your people, that you would give us your grace and that your spirit would fall upon us, that it would challenge us, it would open our hearts, that we would keep the message of the gospel to be true, that we would keep the message of salvation to be true as we tell it to those who need to hear it, as we proclaim it as we are able, as we preach it as you give us the platform to do so. Would we preach Christ crucified? Would we preach Christ risen to save sinners, to bring them eternal life, and to bring them joy in you? Father, we just pray, would you work deep in our minds and deep in our hearts today? Would you help us develop our prayer life with you? Would you speak to us? Would your spirit minister to us? And in the preparation of prayer, Lord, we pray you would open doors for us to be able to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we pray these things in his name, amen. So we're now gonna take communion. We take communion every single week here at Foundation Church as we remember what Christ has done for us. And if you're not a Christian, I would encourage you, please do not take communion here today. Would you meet Jesus instead? Would you turn from your sin? Would you repent of your sin? And would you believe in Him for your joy, for eternal life? As you hear and believe that message, Christ died for you. Christ took your sin He took your punishment, he took your shame, he took it to the cross and he suffered and died for you so that you would not need to suffer or experience shame. And as he did that, he wants to give you his righteousness, he wants to give you eternal life. Would you come to him today? And for those of you who are Christians, as we take the cup, we remember Jesus' blood 
shed for us, shed for the forgiveness of our sins, shed to make us whole again. And as we take the bread, we remember Jesus' body broken for us, broken for the forgiveness of our sins, broken so that we might be whole again, broken so that we might share the message of the gospel, the message that once we believed and saved us now can be shared through your mouth so that somebody else might believe and be saved. Would you come as you are led?